Welcome to Some Bits, where we decode the power school development experience. Some Bits is brought to you by MBA. Let's start the show. Welcome everyone to another episode of Some Bits, joined always by uh, Eric Scheidel and Ryan Cockrum. Um, for the uh, other people that are watching us on the YouTube, you'll see the other guy on screen. Uh, we're joined today by Richard Moeller. That's pronounced correctly, right, Richard Moeller? Yep, you got it. Perfect. Um, today's episode, we're going to talk about automation and kind of some ideas on how to automate some processes um, using some power school tools. Um, but before we get that far, we are back to having a cocktail today thanks to a wonderful person in my life uh happens to be my boss carla she picked me up this bottle of weller special reserve um for our for my whiskey drinkers this is not a very easy bottle to find but if you can get oh. your hands on it it is delicious uh luckily she lives in tennessee so she was able to pick this up for me um not very accessible in indiana um but thank you carla much appreciated um, what are you guys drinking today well, uh, I'm just going back to my favorite right now that Sean introduced me to. I just keep going back to it. Old Tub. <laughs> it's tasty, you know. I like how Lot 40 used to be your favorite. Now it's Old Tub. Yeah, well, this is my favorite bourbon. Lot 40 is my favorite. Oh, okay. um, yep. It's like if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And I've definitely sure. tried a couple of the bourbons. But, man, I like this Old Tub. <laughs> nice. It's okay. uh, flavorful. So I, I, I'm proud of myself. I'm switching it up today. I'm drinking something other than Spotted Cow, though I am sticking with the old still, go-to still brewery. <laughs> yeah, I do love me my new Glarus. Uh, but this one here is called a Cabin Fever. It is a delicious Bach. I, I, I'm, Bach. I'm really digging it. Now that it's, it's nice out, you're going to a Bach? I know. Well, it does, it's named it does. appropriately for the times, though, of everyone being stuck inside and whatnot. Yeah. Cabin Fever. <laughs> That's true. Richard, yeah, are you doing a cocktail today? Brew, but, uh... Yep. Today I am drinking a gin and tonic, just a Beautiful. classic, uh, uh, what is the brand? Bombay with, Bombay. Um, but not the Bombay Bombay. Sapphire. It's actually okay. their London Dry. So okay. I'm oh, going okay. for a classic today. Fair enough. Very good. I haven't had a gin and tonic in a while. Me neither. Making me thirsty a little bit. <laughs> I, I, I gotta really say, no offense, Richard, but I don't understand how anybody can drink tonic. I, I just, <laughs> it's, it's too bitter for me. Well, when it's mixed with gin, sure. I'll say, you gotta mix it with gin. Nobody yeah. drinks tonic on its own. I, right? I've, yeah. I've met people that, that just like sip on tonic. No, so they're, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so for gin, I'm not a fan, except if it's like super expensive gin, because then I guess it just, you know, kills all those impurities. <laughs> gin. Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you um, before we get to the topic at hand, one of my favorite gins of all time is a brand called Uncle Val's. Hmm. Um, it's it's pretty herbal and it's so a lot of gins are super junipery. Yes. So that pine tree flavor. Yeah. Um, the Uncle Val's is a little bit more herbaceous um, and it's it's a really good tasty sipping gin is it like and i forget i was telling you about uh, it's in the um gin family bolivar oh uh jennifer jennifer there you go jennifer it's in the gin family but it's kind of like related to whiskey is the way it was described to me and uh yeah i mean i'm not i'm just <laughs> repeating what's been said to me um <laughs> Because when I told I was told it's kind of like in the gin family, I was like, Ugh. but then I tried it and I'm like, mm. and uh, I found uh, you know just mix it with some um, uh, 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 lime, like bar lime, like make yourself some uh, lemon lime, whatever, and a little bit of simple syrup, and hey, mm. I liked it. It was pretty good. <laughs> uh, I mean, I'll give that a try sour. sometime. Yeah. Hendrix is a pretty good one for it's a little less uh, junipery, a little more yeah. uh, floral, and um, Saint George's Botanivore. That's another more herbaly one that uh, is a lot less on the. I think I bought juniper. Brother <laughs> <laughs> I think my brother's my brother me. likes gin, and I I, I would uh, try to buy. And I, since I don't know gin, I just kind of went to the shelf one time. I was like, that's on the top. I'll buy that. <laughs> <laughs> At an acceptable price point. <laughs> yeah. 
All right, guys, let's talk automation. Um, I know like a lot of people, you know, a lot of things in, in PowerSchool don't necessarily are, are automated right out of the box. You know, some of the few things happen over the nightly process, whether it's emails and, and whatnot, progress reports mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. Um, but I want to talk about some of the other, you know, ways that we can automate things. Um, you know, I have some ideas in my head. I think you guys brought some ideas with you as well. Um, Ryan's going to be quiet in his little corner because he didn't do any uh, homework. Um, I know, right? Called you out. So actually, before we get we, the whole goal is not to do homework. I know, right? Uh, but hey, for the people that aren't familiar with Richard, um, Richard, where are you from? Uh, how'd you get into power school? And then uh, before we get into the automation piece, kind of give our listeners an idea of, of where you're at. Um, so I'm from the suburbs of Chicago. Uh, I've lived out in this area all my life. Uh, I started working in ed tech in around 2007, um, doing networking. And then in 2014, I moved to actually working directly for a school district. And it's there that I ran into power school. So I knew a little bit about SQL and uh, the data team there would sometimes need help with their queries they were writing, and I would jump in and help with that. Um, eventually, a position on the data team opened up. I applied for it, got it, and then the same day, someone else on the data team retired. So kind of a <laughs> <laughs> trial by fire to uh, learn everything power school as fast as possible. And automating things really helped with that you know there was a lot of tasks still being done by hand and just taking tons of time merging spreadsheets in excel and oh, yeah. you know exporting out of dd8 and then dde and dda and yeah it's just been ever since then just working on moving as much of that into automation and off of my plate to be done manually i would say so it sounds like you had the typical power school implementation experience like getting into <laughs> yeah i was gonna say that's that's three of the four of us that kind of entered into the power school world the same way through uh like, through networking and through the it department exactly. <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> eric's still the lone ball over here that actually started as a developer <laughs> <laughs> mr fancy developer man i am the true og <laughs> <laughs> now that was roger we all know that <laughs> Well, yeah, cool, but, Richard. Like, but apologies, no, Roger Sprick, if you're listening. No disrespect, my friend. <laughs> they, we gave him that title. Well, we can't take it back. And Sean, Sean also found your Maltagoya the other day. I did. Uh, I need to. I need to buy some and, and drink it on camera for you. Or at least bring it to Vegas or something if you're listening. I got anyway, yeah. Uh, so yeah, automation. Obviously, Richard, you've you've kind of thought about automation from day one once you got into Power School. Um, you know, any particular projects that you can think of back in the early days where you know, you were still kind of new to PowerSchool, but, you know, saw some leverage of, of tools that you could use inside of PowerSchool to automate some things. Uh, probably the one of the first big projects was our assessment system. Um, we had to get rosters into that. And the process for the person I was replacing was, you know, going to DDE, export, all of the courses that match this course name and then do a VLOOKUP to pull in the student ID numbers out of the CC table. Oh. And, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, it was just this huge step and it would take days and days and days to get this data. And yeah. knowing a bit about SQL, I said, well, you know, what if we just took, you know, this rewrote it all in SQL made it an export that I could run in about five minutes and then upload it right to the website, boom. And the same amount of work done in five minutes that used to take days and days and days. Awesome. So and now based on your timeline that you were saying that was that was that was before Power Queries, right? Um it, I think Power Queries were around then but they were very, very new. Um, yeah. Luckily, we were self-hosted, though. Uh, so yeah. we could do a lot of the SQL work with a, you know, a direct ODBC access. Gotcha. Yeah. I was I was wondering, until you said you went into DDE, I was, you just sparked something in my head thinking back to how we used to have to populate uh, uh, student lists and third-party whatevers. 
and I forget exactly what the target was, but we would be using the student roster report. If anyone's, yeah, we'd be using the student roster report. And this is now back in 2011. And I mean, definitely no power queries. And I mean, at that point, I was really not effective with development side of things at all. So that was the best bet. And I mean, I was trying to figure out how to hack, hack these uh, student roster reports and put in the right uh, dats in there to get the information out and then tell the secretaries how to run it and then how to export that and then use that list wherever <laughs> we needed to do. But still, automation would have solved that some kind of option. And then, yeah. like I said, I didn't know SQL. I didn't have an option for that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think generally speaking, the the whole, the, like the biggest goal for automation is to get as few hands on it as possible, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Because, I mean, as, as anybody that works with data, like the less you deal with it, the, the less likely there is to have errors, which is, you know, that's always the biggest issue, right? To, I mean, on top of that, less people you have involved with managing it never mind the less steps yeah. you have in there just you know i mean that's the whole customization thing you always want to make sure you have redundancy so that if someone gets hit by a bus that someone also knows how to unlock the garage and get in there and do <laughs> stuff <laughs> but right. you also don't want to worry about two people with two different brain waves coming up with different solutions and then <laughs> intermingling halfway through a project and not you know communicating for sure yeah um, and then some other things we've automated are uh, getting reports into power school so that you know when you get that last minute request i need all this data right now well now i can put it into t-list query or sql report or whatever you know whatever works and get that into the system and now you know, the principal can run this report themselves and not have to call me at four o'clock as I'm heading out the door. <laughs> <laughs> so what uh, what kind of reports do you prefer? Like, how do you do your reports generally? Uh, generally, I write them in uh, direct SQL, um, like a SQL developer type tool. Mm -hmm. And we use DB Visualizer as the name of it, but there's a million different other options out there that do the same thing. And it's just what we had already purchased. <laughs> yeah. uh, but um, I'll write the SQL in that, and then um, I'll put it into either a T-list SQL query in PowerSchool and create a page for it, or... Um, you know, there's other tools out there. There's SQL reports. Uh, there's Adam Larson's, uh, or sorry, Schmanum Schmarson's uh, <laughs> <Damn>. SQL Studio. <laughs> we invoke the name. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, I don't know if you guys have missed an episode without mentioning him, but I made one. honestly, I think the last episode was the first episode we've had oh. that uh, that we didn't yeah. mention him. So yeah. we're we're back on we're back on track. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and he's listening right now, grinning ear to ear. <laughs> I know, right? Right? Make it two in a row. <laughs> <laughs> One of these days, we're going to strike you out, Adam Larson, just yeah, so you know. know. Someday. Someday we'll get a third episode where we don't mention his name. Every time you hear the name invoked, you take a shot. Schmarson, <laughs> Oh, careful. He might appear behind you if you say yeah. his name three you times know, right? fast. <laughs> So, sorry, we got a little off topic there. So you were so, talking about the different tools, one being SQL reports. Sorry, SQL Studio. Um, you did mention SQL reports, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Uh, uh, you could also use Power Queries, um, uh, pretty much anything that will either bring it onto a page in Power School or spit it out as a CSV. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if we want to explain CSV. No, we don't go too <laughs> technical. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, I, I mean, mean so everything. like I, I think generally speaking, what, what we're talking about now is, you know, very much school centric, right? You know, you work for the school, you have certain data requests and you start seeing this being requested over and over. You know, how do we automate that process? And I think you you found a great solution. Um, and I'd like to get Eric's insight on this at, from the developer's perspective of you know, when when we think of automation from from a district perspective, it's probably a little bit different than what you think of as as automation from your side. Um, any insights to that? Yeah, so I was um, 
I was a little nervous when we first decided to tackle this conversation because uh, there are very few scenarios where I've ever done what I consider a pure automation. Um, and, and I'm glad, Richard, that you 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 stepped into the power query side of things there, because to me, that's when something becomes, in, in my mind, purely automated uh, is, is set it and forget it. Um, now, don't get me wrong. So this this is interesting. There's definitely a, mu- a a step in the direction of automation, right? When you when you say, oh, you know, years ago when someone needed this information, they'd have to come to me. I'd export it from my uh, ODBC connection, whatever tool I use, and I'd send it their way. Well, now now I've I, I've put, I've put that into Power School, so that end user can just go ahead then and get that data without needing to call me. Um, and that's just, I mean, that's just huge, right? Because especially when you don't know what's going to get tossed at you, what fires are going to start burning from one second to the next during the day, that's that's huge. Mm. But to me, when we get to complete automation, that's one of the wonderful things that I think PowerSchool did with Power Queries. Um, and I know you could do some of this with Autocom and auto send in the past. <laughs> yep. And I just saw a little bit of a cringe, right? <laughs> Full disclosure, I've never set up an, an autocom or an auto send. No reason. Um, but now with power queries, right, from, from what I understand with auto send, the huge uh, drawback is there's no way to filter, right? It's, it's like I'm gonna send my whole out there, right student there. body mm-hmm. out in this auto send. Not um, in, sorry. But what if what if I'm integrating with a special ed system or something like that? You know, like it, it's just a small subset, and that's the beauty of the power queries. Is now, well, well, first let me say I think power queries are cumbersome to work with, but when you get it figured out and you get it working, now you have that tool in Data Export Manager to schedule that bad boy. And, and if you need that information, right what's that? So that and that's the key part right there. That's it, because now I can schedule that. I can set up an SFTP connection with my third party. And to me, that is pure automation, like 100%. Absolutely. So, Except for, and correct right, me if I'm wrong. Ryan's chomping at the bit down there. Let me just well, go ahead and jump in with you're wrong before you say whatever it is you're about to say. <laughs> it's possible. And I and accept I'll eat it. Pro and if you prove and me I wrong. take them as learning experiences because I like to be proved wrong and figure out what I was getting wrong. But with the power queries, and I mean, I've I've worked with them. I've I've uh, worked with the scheduled exports of the power queries and the templates. If you put in uh, arguments, can't schedule the export. My experience has been, please tell me if I'm wrong. But if you put it in so that that the power query, so like say you're going to Data Export Manager and you're going to run it out of there, and it would automatic because you put in the arguments, so like school ID and enroll status let's say just simple and simple um it'll work of course when you're in data export manager and you put those options in but if you try to schedule that export i've not found a way that those will run with the arguments even even in any logical way or putting in like that you know anything um they just won't run they'll always return back zero results that's my thing yeah now I've never I've tried, tried that. Now I've tried it though, but I, it's been a while since I tried it. But I mean, that's what it is. Is basically they do not. Ex, you cannot schedule Power Query exports if they require arguments. Uh, even if you, even if there's something seemingly logical about those arguments that you're putting in, um, it, it ain't gonna happen. Now maybe something's changed. Maybe I've been doing it wrong. You know. <laughs> Don't don't take my word to the bank. Please go and test it out and prove me wrong because I'd love to hear that. But uh, um, and you know, throw it in the comments. <laughs> Let's find yeah, out. Do. But nice. uh, yeah, that's been my experience with with them. Is that um, and the, I mean, it's not like it's a uh, detraction from these versus Autocom because Autocom can't do this either. So right. it's just something I wish, since Power Queries allow those arguments when you're invoking them through other methods that it would allow those in the scheduled exports. But just just to take that one step further, if it's something that you're trying to automate and and schedule to send, wouldn't you have those arguments built into your SQL? 
Yeah, but I'm saying there. I don't know. I can't think of a good example. I mean, the yeah, school ID is an example. Sorry. So I'm just trying to think of a use case where. Oh, so school IDs. Something. I I feel like school IDs would be uh, you know to reduce payloads even, but um, just the fact that you might want to like I mean you could have a big district with a lot of data and a lot of students, and you want to just compartmentalize these individual uh, uh, requests, and you just want to make sure you got one for school A, one for school B, one for school C. So that's Basically, when you at that point in. you would have to have separate exports and separate queries for each school. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Or you could have one that just cycles through all the different IDs. I'm curious because I've never tried this, Richard. Have you ever tried running a, a creating a template with a, a parameter for a Power Query? No, not in Data Export Manager. So I don't know if that's possible. I'm pretty sure I've seen a discussion on that on the Power School User Group forums, but or well, email group. Um, but I don't know if they ever found a solution. Because, yeah, I've seen okay, that come so up before as a problem. You've seen it without, yeah, okay. So I'm, just, I'm still trying to wrap my head around it because if it's something that you're trying to automate and schedule, like how would you expect an argument to be filled out every time? There, uh, there was a reason, and, I, and it's been a couple of years since I... I touched it and tried to work with that, but I had a good reason. Like I yeah. had sound logic for it. <laughs> um, well, one thing I can throw, think of, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead, Richard. I was going to say to boost Ryan's point, I think one what, thing you might want to do is have a separate file per school, but oh, only write yeah. the query once. And so you could schedule the export multiple times, right? You know, the one you set for school A, and then you set another one for school B, and the only thing you're changing is the parameter, but you're still using that same query. Otherwise, yeah. you'd have to write multiple queries, one for each. Yeah. Table. Well, that would be the that's the, the hope, but the problem is is that it uh, will not save the argument. Yeah. Yeah. You know what it will save though? It'll save filters. I'm ninety nine percent sure. So now there's an if wrapped around that, right? That's if it's okay to have the school ID as one of the fields in your export, I can then say, you know, here's my filters where school ID equals 100. I can save that template and that filter will get saved. Uh, and the only reason I think that'd be a problem is if uh, whoever you're shipping this out to goes like, no, I very strictly need this file format and a school ID can't be in it. Well then, then I don't know. No. Yeah. Although, okay, how about this? And, and and I'm just talking out of the back of my head right now because <laughs> I'm a I'm I've done some server side development, but I'm mostly a front end developer. Most of my logic is is in JavaScript. Uh, you know, I develop front end, but in a Data Export Manager, you can also schedule things to get shipped off to a location, a file location on your PowerSchool server. So yep. if you're hosted, right, and you had the wherewithal to write, say, a Python script or something like that, you could schedule your extract and schedule a process on the server to pick up that file and manipulate it. I did things with Node.js on the same, and I know people <laughs> One name which I will not say. <laughs> Node.js, um, but I, I've used Node.js to do uh, to do automation on uh, power queries and hitting the endpoints. And um, then in that case, I could pass in the different uh, I could pass in the different arguments. But the, I mean, that's just I mean that works. But then in that case, you need like a server and you need things to do all that, right? Like, I mean, you just really like the power queries to be able to do that within there and then write out those files where you want them. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. I mean, I guess if you're, if you're hosting it yourself and you have the wherewithal to write that script, mm -hmm. you could write it to access the power query externally and pass in the parameter that you want sent. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's, 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 I see a lot of people and it was just recently, even, I think this is really a good subject about uh, like regarding automation recently on the PSIC forums, people are asking, we're new, should we go to host it or should we self host, yada, yada. Um, and I mean, it really comes down to what you hope to do. I think number one, if you are a district that falls 
within the um, student enrollment count that satisfies the requirements for a single server setup, do it. I think that's oh. less than 6,000 students. It was less than 3,000. I could have changed Is easily. It, 3, it was, less than, it was 3,000 when I was, and that was my district, was just shy of 3,000. Um, I think in that case, it's just because there's so much less headache, obviously. You don't have to worry about an array. You have to have one server, that's that. Um, if you have to go beyond that, then it's way out your needs versus your, you know, whatever's. Um, I, I think you do have a lot more uh, accessibility to your data if you're self-hosted, but mm -hmm. there's also now overhead of yep. managing that server. So, you know, it depends on the size of your tech department, depends on your budget. I think, I think getting hosted takes a lot of uh, stress off your plate. Oh, for sure. You know, so yeah. I, I can't say I can't honestly sell one without selling the other. I think they're both good options. It just depends on your district's need, what your district has around as far as uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> staff. Yeah. And capability of their staff, too. Like, I mean, you might have staff, but you need to make sure you have someone. Yeah, if you have someone who handles the servers and the network already, then sure, host your own. Yeah, for sure. So. I think that begs the question. I'd like to know more than from Richard. You said you are self-hosted in your district, Richard. Yes. And are you are you on an array or are you a single server solution? We're actually a two server solution because we're just over that 3000 count. So we're at 3500 students. Oh, so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So does that mean you just have a database and an application node or do you have more than one app node? Uh, just one app node and one database node. Okay. And so it, 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 does it fall on you to manage that hardware then too? or? Uh, actually, we have uh, a service from PowerSchool where they actually manage the server part. The hard, um, wow. they, don't, they don't manage the hardware per se, but they make sure that the operating system's kept up to date. They make sure oh. PowerSchool's kept up to date. They're always installing the state reporting updates. And they I do it at like 3 a.m. <laughs> so, I've heard that. yeah, um, I think EMS is what they call it. Well, it's kind of um, like best of both okay. worlds. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Well, it's so, so would you ever consider going hosted or do you think you've got the ideal solution with what you just described? And uh, if, um, no, actually answer that question first before I add the follow up. Sorry. No, it's all right. Uh, I would say that this is the ideal solution for us and for me That's um, it. because it's faster um, since it's all local. The server's hosted local. Um, yeah. It's kind of negligible speed-wise now, but back in the day, it used to be a little bit slower to have hosting than versus on your own. And... Um, we get to do things like directly query the database without having to go through a VPN or um, or to use Power Queries all the time. Um, it's pretty nice being able to just write the SQL and even just run it right away if I need to, and not have to uh, not have to VPN in. Sure. Has it been a benefit in your automation having having a network access to that server as well? Yeah, I would say definitely. Um, we actually really don't use Power Queries too often to automate, um, unless the product wants a direct API access to our server. Otherwise, we usually write the SQL in uh, the tools we use, and then that also has the ability to automate the export to CSV and then I just use um, you know WinSCP or something to upload that file up to SFTP. Oh, and you can schedule that through WinSFTP or WinSCP. Sorry, I'm butchering. <laughs> yeah. But you can um, automate. Just that say process. a bunch of letters. Usually, I just use the built-in <laughs> Windows Server tools to to automate you know to schedule those tasks. Oh, okay. Kick off yeah. a batch file or something like that. What? Are um, oh, yes. Basically Sorry. batch files, but we use PowerShell usually okay. just because ah. it gives a little bit more control and more features. Um, but overall, it's basically the same as a batch file. Quick, quick tangent there, Eric. Did, are you, did you specify batch file because that was what you like, you know, 
cut your teeth on and then you never really got into PowerShell. That's exactly right. Same thing for me. Same That's thing exactly for me. right. I, I still I, use fast files if I can. I don't know partial at all. I knew just I enough to be dangerous and, and figured out how to write a batch file. And ever since then, it's just all, all right, I, I've just been focusing on client-side stuff. So, Yeah. yeah. You know, and, I, and I think that, that goes to speak a lot for, um, again, looking at what your staff ability is um, because you know obviously Richard came from a background of that and has skills based around that um, you know not a lot of districts are going to have that so you know something like the power query and scheduled exports using going to going to SFTP is is going to get you a, a similar result just done a different way mm -hmm. you know and, and creativity is always a fun part of power school is there's there's usually multiple ways of doing the same thing yeah. Not always documented. Not always documented. <laughs> That's why I said usually. Never never say 100% of the time, right? I, I was just kind of thinking as we were talking here. Um, I'm sorry, you, did you get that follow-up here there, Eric? No, oh, yeah. I missed something. You were going to ask a follow-up, and now I think you didn't. Oh, I, well, I no. think, you know, yeah, no. And I think Richard kind of answered... Uh, you know, if you wouldn't consider, if you wouldn't want to go to hosting, then then what were the reasons? Like, why, what makes life better? And, and you know, you dug into that with the, the database access and uh, the performance. Cool. So, well, good. Then as long as I didn't cut you off there, because I wanted you to finish yours, I was, I was wondering, um, not wondering, it's kind of a thought I had here as we were talking about, I mean, we were talking about even before this, uh, automation can just be in general making reports, like any kind of reports, like anything that someone has called you on more than one occasion to get you information for. But if you can make it so that now they don't have to call you, they can click a button, that's automation. But uh, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> Said but it's, it's no sorry but it is how automation can be actually i didn't lose my train of thought i just fumbled my words there it's how automation can be uh not just something that's scheduled nightly it's how it can be just any customization really um it's anything that reduces the clicks it's it's workarounds uh that's mm -hmm. what i was that was my original thought there that i lost there it's it's just that uh, kind of combining the whole concept of our last episode with workarounds um automation is workarounds uh yep. because you don't have to get called every day i mean the one that i was just thinking then as we were talking about sftp clients is i think i used filezilla but that's how i would create uh, uh regular access and exports to um our uh student notification system like uh, the uh, the the phone dialers um, and then also upload to uh, I forget the name. There's a third party grade management thing that the teachers like to use in my district and the same thing. I would just pop out exports there and I would just be running it through there and it would all go up to that STF, SFTP client. And, you know, I would click a button. It wouldn't run on a nightly process, but I've also learned ideas and since then. But yeah. Yeah, one yeah. one automation thing that uh actually had uh, Roger's help with that one of the PSUGs um, was I found basically a pain point for our district was always making sure that the homeroom field was populated. You know, uh, so you do that at the beginning of the school year, great, great, and wonderful. Now, every time a kid comes in, you're basically having to know that that kid's coming in or make sure somebody's putting in that data into the homeroom field. Um, and because of so many other reports that are based on that, making sure the spelling's correct, making sure everything's the exact same. Um, so we ended up doing kind of an automated process using a, a Power Query to export. Um, and what we ended up using was the, uh, um, what is it, uh, not, I got familiar name stuck in my head, but preferred name for staff. Yeah. We actually use that for like the, the homeroom field for that teacher. So just a power query that exported that and then using Autocom to bring that back in to the uh, to the students homeroom field. Um, and it was it worked great. Um, you know, and it, and it wasn't a huge deal. You know, something like a homeroom field isn't like necessary on a daily basis because of funding or state reporting or anything like that. Um, but that's it's those types of things that get pushed back to the back burner because it's not important. Um, so then you end up finding yourself, you know, a month down the road that 
now you need to run this report and you got a bunch of missing kids that you don't even know about. So then you got to take the time to go back and fill in data. So, you know, for, for me, automation is also, you know, not just saving the clicks and everything, but, you know, data integrity, making sure that things are, are correct um, but, yeah. or at least consistent, mm -hmm. right? No, yeah. well, in, in, integrity, like, I mean, in, that's the word for database is like, yeah. Yeah, we do similar things with um, the with the homeroom and the homeroom teacher. Um, I have those on an automated uh, SQL export that then gets auto comed back in to make sure that field is correct. Um, same with um, uh, some of the state fields, actually. Like here in Illinois, there's a there's a Title One program, is what it's called. And when one of our schools is um, qualifies for it, what you have to do is every single student in that school, you have to set a single field to say school wide title one. <laughs> they they I don't know why they don't know this on their back end. <laughs> um, but easier said in, than done, right? Yeah. So what we do is just automate the export of that and then automatically import that field so that you know the school doesn't have to remember okay i'm one of the title one schools i have to go here and click this for every single new student i register right it's right. just little things like that save not only yourself time but you know your school office your principals um you know pretty much anybody <laughs> yeah. well the errors because i mean i remember Let's let's be honest. If you're early on, and I mean, especially Sean and I, because uh, I mean, you're saying you came on around the time Power Queries were new. Sean and I were definitely before that. And setting up a new school year, all the repetitive clicks for the new schools, all the things that you had to make sure you checked off in every box and everything <laughs> like that. <laughs> It, it, it would be like, let's Sean, let's see, did you do this where you'd open 10 different tabs for 10 different schools and you just keep switching school? Yeah. Yep. And you do that and you click, okay, go to this tab, click on these three, click, you know, you know, repeat, 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 and then submit. And it's easy. It's like calendars. Even Is that? <laughs> calendars, setting up calendars. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I mean, your eyes are just like, oh, oh, you know, you're, you know, and you're just like feeling yourself missing things, and you're dra almost like falling asleep as you're dragging your cursor across <laughs> these boxes. And any, I mean, they've come a long way. Power schools come a long way since then. They've done a great job, honestly, with. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Like you know, again, like there's a lot of pieces that have been that Power School themselves have created automation around, and calendars mm -hmm. being a, a, a great example. Yeah. Um, you know, setting up a district calendar and pushing it to all your schools is a wonderful, yeah. wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's funny. Assuming you have the same day names and the same bell schedule names and, yeah. It's funny. It's know. almost like they're, the way power school has come across now, I wouldn't have had the uh, need and desire to, you know, customize it and get into it as much as I needed <laughs> now as I did back then because now some of these headaches are, like, solved already just out of the right. box. <laughs> So good on you, power school. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, and some okay, of those. Know, uh, oh, a, a lot of this conversation started with with your side, but um, I want to make sure you had all of your thoughts out there as far as what you think of automation. And has there been any automation that you could think of that you've done in in your development that may not be covered by what we've already talked about, or any cool ideas? Sorry, were you asking me? I missed I something there. Oh, you were asking me. <laughs> yeah. I, I thought maybe I, you missed, I missed that. I missed a couple words there. in there, and I'm like looking at Richard here, going. I actually That's thought it was for Richard too. <laughs> <laughs> so Especially here's when you said, I, "All I caught was this conversation kind of started with you," and I was like, "Okay, so it's Richard." <laughs> That's so, it, yeah. so here's Nothing one that I'm here. that I'm super proud of, to be honest with you, when it comes to automation, and this is. You know, trying to take automation a step further to completely auto be completely automatic. Um, so we have a process in one of the plugins that I developed that has to keep a couple of tables in sync. Um, and it used to be, ba, ba, well, it, ba. it still is, <laughs> that you have to go to actually hit this link to go to this page 
so that my logic can run. Because again, something that a lot of folks don't quite understand as, as PowerSchool customizers, we're not getting access to the back end. And what do I mean by the back end? I mean the code that's running on the server. It's not like as a customizer, you can create something that gets pushed into the nightly process. It just doesn't work that way. And I've literally had uh, a client tell me that my approach was archaic because it required a user to go visit a page for something to occur. Oh, okay. You're talking about the same ideas I've had then right there. <laughs> and, and I'm like, you know, look, uh, it's, it's real easy to throw throw that out there. And it might sound, look at first blush is like, it's archaic. You shouldn't have to, to go click a button every time you want something to happen. In the age of computers, we automate things. But problem is, again, when we're front end developers, that code's running in a browser. It's not running on the server. So yes, it requires someone to log in and go somewhere for the code to run. So anyway, I'm getting really verbose in my description here, but I was pretty proud of what I came up with. Uh, I put a page. I just want to say there, it is archaic, but like honestly, but it is the best option given right. the environment and circumstance. Yeah, it For is. Sure. And frankly, it, and just because. I've, you know, I know, I know where you're going with it. I know what's going. It's a great option. Yeah. So anyways, sorry. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> so what I did was I put a, a page fragment on the home screen that uh, will run out and assess the student records, whatever other records that need to be assessed and alert the end user. This process needs to be executed. Something is out of sync. Um, so that right there from the home screen without having to go remember once a week i gotta go here run this function see if anything got updated it'll actually check in the background when you log into the home screen and say yeah there's some records that need to be updated now if i wanted to i could have gone a step further in automating that and just had it update that stuff in the background but too many people want to know what's going on with their data so what i did instead was just put an alert there on the home screen uh, they click a button, it takes them to that function that they would have had to remember to visit from time to time before. And another thing, by the way, I want to throw out there is that I did that because some people might be thinking this is a great idea and I should do it. And you might want to take some things into consideration. And other people might be thinking, gosh, Eric, what are you doing to the, the poor server here? Um, I was just going to say that. I've been that guy before where I've written a process that runs for, say, every user every time they hit a page. And then you install it on someone's system and they're like, wow, what did you do to PowerSchool, man? It's just so much slower <laughs> since slow. we installed your customization. Wait, wait, so what I is made it right it, now? jQuery is slowing down my system? Yeah, I saw that one. That was crazy. Yeah. <laughs> but in a nutshell, what it does is it's a user preference. So it only runs if you have selected that you want to receive set alerts. And there's a timer on it so that query will only run maximum once an hour. And that and that's the key right there. And I've had the same idea, and it's the same um, uh, all around similar concept. And I'll run it for any user would log into the admin portal, but daily it would check a flag, so it would just be like would be like a T list with an AJAX wrapped inside of a T list, you know that kind of thing. And the first one will just come and find: has it been set? The flag has been set today. Yep. Okay. Stop. No more. Only only the first time a user logs in in that 24 hour period will the rest of it uh, invoke. So, yeah, and I mean, it's it's you're not bogging down the system at that point. You're still I mean, you're doing the check, but I mean, that's a check for a quick uh, select from, uh, you know, standalone table uh, if if record equals today's date and value equals one. So it's it's a super duper light query. Um, and then if, if, uh, that returns back as falsey, then go ahead and do the rest of it. But yeah, that's, I think that's the coolest. I think that's the best and awesomest workaround for automation in power school to do things. Uh, and, and I think there's so much, um, possibility with that in general, with, uh, syncing tables and sending records and updating things and yeah. Yeah, I've actually got a similar example uh, for our home screen. I've got a page fragment that tells the school office these students have a either mismatched um, enrollment with their start date 
So because they need to be enrolled in an attendance class in order for attendance to work. So um, it checks to see if there's any you know mismatches in the data alignment with when they start the class and when they start at school. Um, and it this is there's a built-in report for it. Oh, I was just getting reports, but they have to actually go to the report okay. to run it. So this is basically doing that report and giving them a notice. These students have this error, and you can just That's click smart. on it and go right to that student and right to the all enrollments page or That's the scheduling smart. setup page. Yeah, honestly, Back data integrity, right? That's that the one reason we ought to you should throw that one on the exchange. Like, I don't know if you have maybe already, but I mean, that one, um, just thinking of the back when I was at a district, like, hell, like, I mean, that's part of your end of year process, running that yeah. and then tracking down all those errors. Mm -hmm. And if you throw that on the front there like that, boy, oh boy, will that save you a lot of time and errors at the end of the year. Cool idea. Instead, of, like, instead of you dealing with it at the end of the year when all your secretaries are gone. Yeah, that, that's, the biggest <laughs> that's the biggest part there. And that's why I think that's such a great idea. Yeah. So have, you thought, yeah. have you thought, Richard, about what else you would put on that home page? And again, I mean, I think you always just have to keep in the back of your mind. I can't check for everything but the kitchen sink, especially if it's not limited by user or by time, because mm -hmm. all of a sudden every user is running this really heavy lifting query. But I mean, is there other stuff that you thought, gee, you know, check for this, too? I don't know. The kids, kids got a certain field value here, and they're supposed to be enrolled in a special program, but oh, that didn't happen. I mean, there's just the potential for keeping your data integrity uh, tight. Yeah, that's just especially such a, a cool tool. Especially when it's on the on the start page and it's in somebody's face. Yeah. Um. I haven't really, or I've thought of a few things, but just haven't had the time to implement them and probably won't need them next year. But in regards to the current way things are running in schools, um, we have a very complex system for our attendance because we have to report the in-person attendance separately from the remote student attendance. A lot of states are doing that right now. Yeah. And my province is uh, all schools are closed again. Oh wow! Okay, <laughs> we're we're still open and uh, numbers are good here right now. So, knock on wood. Uh, <laughs> but um, so one of the confusing things is we use tracks to denote if the students in person or remote because there's all the yep. tools PowerSchool added with twenty dot four dot two. I want to say that gave the ability for teachers to separate their students and view them by track. So that was a huge help. Um, so we're using the tracks, but we also have a separate field that we were using before we switched to tracks that also needs to be maintained. And that one's not tied to attendance like the tracks are. But what happens is a student might need to quarantine or whatever reason stay home for maybe a couple of weeks. And we want to mark them as remote, but we don't want to change their, you know, their learning right. preference. So we have to try to keep these somewhat in sync. So it'd be, or that would have been probably a good one to figure out is having an alert saying there are 20 students that are marked remote. You're sorry, marked in person, but they have the remote track. And that's something I could think that would be useful as one of those alerts. Um, but also it's tied to our very convoluted <laughs> strings and wire implementation we did. Uh, you, so everything you're just kind of describing there, uh, possibly, I don't know, maybe with in addition to your, uh, your alerts for the uh, in-person students that are now remote learning, Though I've mentioned a couple times in previous episodes how that was a mind baby of uh, the PSUG forms, all that tracks and stuff. I loved seeing that. Yeah. And I, I, I think that's my favorite part about that community, especially in, a, in this situation, how they all came together. And I mean, you were obviously involved in that somehow. Like, I mean, you, you took part in it and everyone benefited from it and that's why i always love power school is that it's that community spirit mm -hmm. 
and that community uh, mentality behind it. And uh, and I mean, frankly, you know, trying to come up with the extra solution that you're looking for, why not throw it out there almost like, you know, and see, <laughs> see what, like, you know, because I, I mean, honestly, I mean, you're not the only one, yeah. really. You know, yeah, there's no way you're the only one. And and for the people listening, if you do have stories of automation and, and things that you've done in, you know, in your in your district or whatever, let us know. Mm-hmm. Uh, some bit some bits at mba dash link dot com, um, or just in the comments, or That's just cool in too. the comments. Absolutely. Um, you know, while we're talking about that, might as well say if you have other episode ideas, episode ideas, let us know that as well. But uh, yeah, let us know. Um, well, if you want to be letting yes. us know. Speaking What's of that? letting us know, I just want to call yes, out too. the fact that the reason we're having this topic today is because Richard has been a listener and he reached out to us and said, "Hey." I'd love to talk about automation. So thank you, Richard, for being that guy. And thank you for yes, joining absolutely. us. Yep. Oh, thank you. Yeah, this is a fan episode, whole and whole. I mean, it's a, it's a fan <laughs> series, but I mean, this is a very special fan episode. <laughs> absolutely. You're definitely here because you are a listener, and that's awesome. Um, so so see, everybody, it happens. You can, you can be on the show, too. <laughs> and who knows? Then maybe you'll be in Hollywood next thing, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've already got my. Uh, as long as you promise not to mention him, <laughs> we're, try, we're trying to go. It's not like it's a crime to, um, but uh, we're trying to avoid it so we don't have to pay too many royalties. Exactly, <laughs> he's gonna start charging us just for using his name. <laughs> but yeah, um, so unless you guys got anything else to add that you really wanted to talk about, you know, different projects that you've automated, love to hear from our listeners. See what you guys have done in, on uh, on the topic of automation. Um, we do have swag available, um, so link of that will be down in the description as well. Um, but unless you guys got something else, Richard, thank you so much for joining us today. It was awesome having a fan of the podcast on today. Uh, it was nice talking automation with you. Um, I agree. It was a great topic. And uh, if it wasn't for you, we may not have uh, had an episode on it. So thank you so much, oh, guys. Thanks. Cheers to you. See you next year. And I still actually don't know what the next time is, but I'll just say next time on an all new some bits, we sit down with someone and talk about with something. (laughs) Bye, everyone. Thanks for joining us. And a special thanks to our subscribers. Consider becoming one today. Enjoy more episodes and learn more at mba-link.com.